Decentralized finance is one of the things that cryptocurrency and blockchains themselves have truly revolutionized the way we actually handle our finances. Common investors like myself can now make 10, 100, 1,000 times better returns than we would have seen in places like traditional finance. So in this video, this is going to be a huge video where we unpack what decentralized finance or DeFi really is. How does it really work? What are the risks associated with it? And how can you get started on a very fast and affordable blockchain like Solana? Let's get going. I personally have left traditional financial markets completely behind. I've left them in favor of decentralized financial markets, cryptocurrency, blockchain, and NFTs. And in this video, I want to tell you all about why I feel so excited about DeFi. But you should know right now that that doesn't necessarily mean that that's what you should do too. I am not a financial advisor. None of this should ever be construed as financial advice. I'm not a professional. I'm just an average Joe off the street having a conversation with my friends about stuff that I'm excited about. You should always do your own research on the investments that you're investing in because investing, especially in cryptocurrency and DeFi, is a risky thing to do. That's why I'm also going to talk about what the risks are associated with DeFi. So with that being said, what is decentralized finance and how are people making money off of it? Let's talk about it. I want you to think for a moment about how you used to trade cryptocurrency or at least how you're doing it right now. Let's pretend for a moment you're using something like Coinbase or FTX or Binance or whatever exchange you want to use. Think about that exchange for a second. With the exchange, you bring some fiat in, and then you buy some Ethereum. This is going to, no, that, that's not going to work. I was going to draw a diamond. I can't draw. Let's just put Ethereum right here. Let's say for a moment you have uh, $1,000 worth. Let's, let's say you have, I want you to think for a moment about how you trade cryptocurrency right now, or how you've been trading cryptocurrency, at least the traditional way. You go to an exchange, someplace like Coinbase or someplace like FTX or Binance or Crypto.com or whatever, and you use your fiat currency in order to purchase cryptocurrency. But from then, from then on, you're in the system, right? You're, you're on the blockchain at that point. So let's say you buy one Ethereum. You know, that's roughly 4,000, 3,000 bucks at the time of this recording. And you have this Ethereum, you feel good about this Ethereum, it's moving up and down pretty well, but then something else catches your eye. Something like Solana comes along and you're checking out Solana and you're like, hey, Solana brings a lot to the table because the, the actual transactions themselves happen in less than one second. Their, their finality is actually 12 seconds, but the transaction itself happens in basically one second and there's no gas, well, there is gas, but it's very, very, very small. It's way less than one penny. So it's basically a free transaction and I'd be really interested in using that instead of using Ethereum. So how do you actually go about using Coinbase to get Ethereum? What happens under the hood? Well, you would, uh, choose to go, you click on the convert button, right? And you convert your Ethereum into Solana. You just tell how much you want it to do. But what really happened here? What really happened here is that Coinbase under the hood has a humongous pool of Ethereum. And then they have a humongous pool of Solana. They call this their very important term here. They call this their liquidity pool because it's a pool of these currencies that they can use to provide liquidity to each of these transactions. So when you want to swap your Ethereum for Sol, what you're really doing is you're depositing your one ETH back into their pool and pulling some Solana out. At the time of this recording, if ETH is $3,000, then you're basically pulling out 20 Sol uh, in order to get that back, because Solana Sol is uh, about 150 bucks, roughly, at the time of this recording. So you don't really see any of this going on. You think you're literally just swapping Ethereum for Solana, which in effect you are. But what you're really doing is you're depositing your Ethereum into their gigantic, colossal pool and pulling some Solana out to do that. The kicker here is that they have 
so much money. They have so much Ethereum and so much soul that when you do this, uh, it doesn't really impact their ability to transact in one direction or the other, nor does it really impact the price of the currency itself. Your one transaction is minuscule uh, in the grand scheme of these things of, you know, $100 billion blockchains. So beyond that, there's plenty of people, they have plenty of volume going in the opposite direction too. So the pool never gets really out of balance or anything like that. And that's how what we call CFI or centralized finance really works. This is also goes hands in hands with, unfortunately, sex, uh, centralized exchanges. This is how they actually work too. Beyond that, when they have this tremendous pool of cryptocurrency, they can actually enter into financial markets and start giving out loans at the same time, much in the same way that a bank does. So the question then becomes is how does Coinbase make money? They make money all sorts of ways. Uh, or really not just Coinbase. That's not right to say Coinbase because really this is all centralized exchanges. Um, they make money by fees. They make money by, you know, if you uh, have a loan, they can do loans, things like that. Every time you swap, there's a fee that goes back and forth. There's just a bunch of different ways that Coinbase has a, a debit card, which is really awesome. I have the Coinbase debit card and I love Coinbase. I love Coinbase, I love FTX, I love all of these centralized exchanges. In no way am I telling you that CFI is a bad thing. It's not, it's a good thing. It's a great way for especially newcomers to get onboarded into the blockchain ecosystem. And it's a great on-ramp for fiat to blockchain uh, transactions to take place. So keep that in mind. Where DeFi differs is people are now providing their own pool. That way they can collect their own fees. A great example of this, I think one of the very first to ever do it was Uniswap. And Uniswap exists on the Ethereum blockchain. So with Uniswap, what they do is they have their own liquidity pool and they specify exactly what the liquidity pool is for a specific currency exchange. For instance, they'll have a liquidity pool for Ethereum to USDC. And then they'll have a separate liquidity pool for Ethereum to USDT. And you can choose which pool you want to contribute to. So I come along, me as an average investor, I say I've got all of this uh, excess Ethereum and USDC in my, my MetaMask wallet right now, right? And I would like to let you Uniswap use it. And in return, I would like to get some form of return for doing that. So Uniswap, being that they are a decentralized finance, what they've done is they have allowed these liquidity pools to exist in a decentralized manner. People, the average person like me, now creates the liquidity pool. So I can come along and deposit my Ethereum into this liquidity pool and my USDC into the same liquidity pool. And now, whenever anybody comes along and wants to exchange, they want to exchange Ethereum for USDC, there's gonna be a fee associated with that, right? Exactly like how Coinbase charges a fee or FTX charges a fee or whatever. But the difference is, is that fee is now turned around and paid out to the DeFi holders, the people who contributed their money into the pool. So now I have a way of actually earning a return on my excess Ethereum and USDC by just adding it into the liquidity pool. And what you end up seeing is that the returns are pretty juicy because people exchange things all the time. So if this is DeFi and we're talking about exchange, the next key term you should know is DEX. This is a decentralized exchange. This is in contrast to a centralized exchange. Another cool benefit about DeFi and the fact that we're doing this is it's your keys, right? At the end of the day, now you actually have control over your wallet and where the cryptocurrencies go. So you can absolutely use your ledger wallet with MetaMask or Phantom, and you can have control over what goes on in your wallet. Of course, that comes with additional risks too, because some DeFi actors are not very good people. Some DeFi people are actually out to get you. And that sets up a very big topic, 
well, if the returns are so juicy from this, what are actually the risks? The risks are pretty simple and laid out, uh, and they should be obvious, but if you're new to the space, they're not. But there's also risks that I have had to learn the hard way, and I'm going to explain those to you, and those are the financial risks. First of all, the technical risk that you should know about. DeFi is truly decentralized in the sense that anyone who can write a smart contract can create a DEX. And the problem with that is that a lot of bad actors out there can write smart contracts. So when you connect into a website, you're going to see the Web3 connect button, right? And you connect to it, and then you see the deposit button, right? You click that deposit button. MetaMask prompts you, do you want to allow or confirm or whatever? And then the moment you click that, if you didn't actually read the contract and what it's doing, you could have just emptied your entire wallet. You could have. I mean, it's the same, the exact same risks that you run in any single Web3 interaction that you do, uh, because that's just the world that we live in. So, I mean, people get scammed all the time out of NFTs, right? Somebody goes to a bad website that looks legit, they click connect, they click firm, and next thing they know, all their NFTs and all their cryptocurrency is gone. Happens. The next thing is that this website that was created could have been created by totally legit people, people who legitimately want to stand up a decentralized finance ecosystem. They want to build an amazing, robust ecosystem, but they're not very good at coding. And they actually code a smart contract that has security flaws in it, and those security flaws get hacked and exploited. And now the entire DeFi website, the entire DeFi business that you're on has been drained dry. We see this all the time, and it's very unfortunate. But you'll see hacks come up, I want to say once a month, once every other month, on all sorts of chains, whether that's Matic, BSC, AVAX, Thor. You see it all the time that some DeFi ecosystem was hacked and like $80 million worth of Ethereum were drained out of that entire ecosystem. Now, a lot of times the hackers return the funds and say, I was doing this to let you know that you know you were have this huge flaw, and I tried to point it out, you didn't listen to me, so now I showed you that you have this huge flaw. So lots of times that happens, but nonetheless, lots of times people get, they hack the DeFi website, and then it's gone. Nothing here is regulated. So uh, all of this is a lot of DeFi ecosystems are trying to create new financial products that oftentimes don't work. They literally fail. They, the protocol literally implodes on itself. And whatever you invested in goes all the way down to zero. So there's a lot of financial risks associated with that too. So I guess my what I'm trying to say here is you shouldn't just ape into DeFi. This is not something uh, that you should take lightly because I have learned the hard way that that I really want to stick to the solid DeFi projects that have been for a long time and know what they're doing and they're not trying to reinvent the wheel or really shake up the world and revolutionize in such a humongous way because uh, without being actually battle tested and watching how it performs over a certain period of time, you could end up seeing something like a protocol that completely implodes on itself and people lose a tremendous amount of money doing that. Again, nothing I say here is financial advice. You should always do your own research. But at this point, we will now transition into actually looking at what the DeFi world looks like and what the risks are associated with that. And then we're gonna actually talk about how to do it. How do you actually start getting a real yield on some of something like your stable coins or your blue chip tokens that you have? So for these demonstrations, I'm gonna be going through this from the Solana blockchain because the Solana blockchain ecosystem uh, as well as the DeFi ecosystem is really, really well put together. It's really well designed. Solana is a great blockchain for DeFi because it's extremely fast and it's extremely cheap. Uh, therefore, very rapid transactions can happen here at very minimal cost that is non-impactful whatsoever uh, to people's bottom line. So what I want to start off with is soulfarm.io. This is actually kind of starting at the end of the journey, but it's where I start mine when I decide what kind of DeFi products and what kind of yields do I really want to get. So what Soul Farm does is you've already deposited into a liquidity pool. What Soul Farm does is they automatically harvest the profits 
and reinvests them into the same liquidity pool. The end result is you get an auto compounding feature. It automatically compounds all of the time and it gives you significantly better returns when you do that. The, the other cool thing about it is, is again, because Solana is so incredibly fast and so incredibly cheap, it doesn't cost really anything to do that auto compounding. So they do it many, many, many times a day. And where your eyes should probably be drawn right now is to the APRs and the APYs. Okay, what's the difference here? An APR is, what is the, oh, I wrote that wrong, that was ARP. Uh, the APR is just the raw yield on what you invested today. An APY is, what is the yield when we auto compound the APR? Let's say this auto compounds 12 times a day or every two hours. So this is going to be what you're going to get in a day. But after a week of auto compounding, the APY kicks in. Very cool, right? So I like to focus in on the APYs. And now you've got to start to think about what is your investment horizon at this point. Do you anticipate that you're going to withdraw this money uh, maybe in the next week or two weeks or three weeks or four months? Then maybe the weekly API is really attractive to you. If you're going to park your money there and let it sit for a year, then maybe the yearly APY is there for you. So if I sort these in a descending order, uh, immediately your eyes are drawn into these big numbers, right? 1,000 APY, uh, 600 APY, 300 APY, and you're going whoa, how do I make that kind of money? There's no catch, right? There is. There's a catch. And what I want you to do is I want you to focus in on what the liquidity pools are. You see this LP? That's liquidity pool. And what you're looking at here is you're looking at what are the two tokens that you can deposit into to make up this liquidity pool. And the interesting thing about these is when you see these humongous yields, very often, if not almost every single time, the tokens that you're looking at here are some form of like stable coin or blue chip token like Solana, right there Solana. But the other token is what we like to call a native token. That means a business or an app is launching on the blockchain and they're issuing their own token. That's what we call the native token. So in this case, Orca is a native token to the Orca finance ecosystem. Grape is a native token to the Grape protocol. Samo is uh, Solana's meme token, kind of like what Dogecoin is. Bop uh, is the Boring Protocol native token for the Boring Protocol VPN application. So these tokens exist in their own ecosystem. Now, I'm going to say this, and what I'm going to say is going to sound harsh. It's not meant to be harsh. It's just calling out why these tokens are, why these APYs are as high as they are. So when there's a native token, very frequently the catch that comes with these native tokens is an infinite supply. And what really happens here is these organizations are just continuing to create more and mint more and more and more and more and more and more tokens, like just rolling them out all the time. If you do something in their ecosystem, you are rewarded with a native token. And that native token has a dollar amount or, you know, a value associated with it. If you were to swap it for USDC, you might get something like, make up something like three USDC or three dollars. So here's the kicker. If I look at something like a thousand, 116.66%, this is a Larix USDC LP. I know nothing about Larix. I'm not saying this is a good or a bad token. I'm just talking about what I've experienced in the past in the real world. What I assume this means is if Larix is worth some dollar amount and they are minting so many of them per day, if that dollar amount stays the same, you will in fact get a thousand percent APY because you're just getting so many Larixes every single day. But the problem with that is that that very frequently doesn't stay the case because it's just a simple rule of economics. There is going to be a line that looks like this. This is going to be your supply. And then there's going to be a line that looks like this. This is going to be your demand. 
The way this works is, is pretty straightforward. I'm, I'm sorry I'm going to go this nerdy for you, but you really need to understand the risk associated with getting a native token. On the y-axis, we have price, and on the x-axis, we have quantity. Where supply and demand meet, that tells you exactly what the current market is. It tells you how much people want and how much they're willing to pay to get it. So the thing that happens here in a supply and demand price is when you're constantly creating more and more and more supply, what happens is, is the supply line itself shifts outwards over time. So the next day comes along and look, the price of the token has now fallen. And then another day passes and the supply line shifts out one more time. And now the price of the token has fallen again. The issue here is that unless something happens, unless the token has so much utility or value that it also increases demand with it, then the price is truly inflationary. Meaning that they're just going to keep minting and 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 minting as many tokens as humanly possible that the price will just continue to fall because all people really do with those tokens is they swap them for USDC because they don't provide enough utility for those people to want to hold them. So you should know right now that when you're investing in DeFi worlds that the moment you move outside of stable coins and blue chip tokens like Ethereum and Sol, and you move into native tokens, you're going to be incurring a lot more risk because what you're really betting on there is that uh, the native protocol itself, the one that you're trying to, to get into, like Orca or Lyrics or Grape or uh, Bop or Polis, which is from Atlas or Star Atlas, uh, you're betting that the demand for those tokens will continue to stay stable or rise with it because the protocol is doing something special. Again, Nothing wrong with that stance whatsoever. What I'm saying is that when you approach DeFi, you shouldn't just go off of the yearly APY because oftentimes there's a catch, there's a gotcha, there's something you need to know about how quickly they're increasing the supply of their native tokens. So me personally, what I like to use DeFi for is a replacement for a savings account. I like to have very quick liquidity, just like a savings account, but I want much better yields. A huge benefit to DeFi in general is the fact that you can withdraw it at any time. So let's say that I want to use just stable coins. I want cash and I want to get a better yield on my cash. So what I can do from Soul Farms website is I can click on, let's say, USDC and I'm going to scroll down until I get out of the native tokens. Now look at that right there. Soul USDC. That's a blue chip token. I, I like Soul. I feel bullish about it. And USDC makes the other half 72% APY. 72% APY. Tell me a financial, a traditional, traditional financial market that you can get in right now where you've got that kind of yield. Now, this is not a this is not a guaranteed 72%. The APY is volatile. It will go up and down as the value of the pool itself goes up and down, as the value of the token that it's farming, Orca, goes up and down. I mean, this is how it really works. You deposit SOL and USDC into the LP. What's going to end up happening is Orca is going to pay you in the Orca token. What Soul Farm actually does is they collect that Orca token, swap it to Soul in USDC, and redeposit it back into the pool on your behalf. This is why you go to Soul Farm, is because they handle all of that for you. And the fact that Solana is so stinking fast, it, it just it happens all the time. <laughs> it's right, it's, and it costs nothing. That's the huge benefit to uh, using you know these types of blockchains like Solana. So. If my goal is to grow the amount of SOL and USDC that I have using DeFi right here from the Orca protocol, I can accomplish that at roughly a 72% as of today. I would totally expect this uh, to be fluctuating and even trend downwards as the market wakes up to you know this type of APY and starts to flood this entire pool with liquidity. But nonetheless, this is a great return that I could get right now. So why don't I do that? Let's do it. So to get started doing this, what do we have to do? If I click on Sol uh, USDC LP, 
Uh, I see that this is at Orca. So what I will have to do to make this pull, to pull this off correctly, what we have to do is we have to have a 50-50 deposit. Meaning if I deposit one soul, then I have to deposit an equivalent amount of USDC, which, you know, makes something up. Let's say it's $150, which is roughly what it is today. So the problem with me right now is I have soul, I have no USDC, so I need to go get it. Probably one of the best places to go do that is Radium. So if I go to radium.io, I'll get logged into my Phantom Wallet. And because I've been to Radium before, it automatically connects me in the top right. You'll have to get connected uh, if this is your first time coming here. Now from the dropdown here, I can click on Soul, and now it brings up Soul. And from the second dropdown, I can say I want to swap some of it to USDC. One of the handiest things about Radium that no other uh, DeFi is, this is a DEX, this is a decentralized exchange. We're literally interacting with somebody else's DeFi pool. We're interacting with the Radium DeFi pool right now. Isn't that fancy? So what I can do right now is I can actually click the half button and it will show me exactly half uh, of my sole balance and what it would translate to in the terms of USDC. This is a little bit too much. I still want to leave myself a little bit of soul to play with uh, in case I, you know, want to invest in an NFT or something like that. So maybe what I'll do is I'll invest 15 soul. I'll just type it in. It automatically updates the USDC and I'll click the swap button. It's going to prompt me to approve the transaction, which I need to do on my ledger device once I get it unlocked. Okay, I click approve. Oh, I got to connect and it's approved. Let's see how long this transaction takes and it's done. That's how long transactions take on the Solana blockchain. Now in my wallet, uh, I have my Sol left over. I also have the USDC. So I can jump back to Sol Farm, click on this. Oh wait, we need to connect to Sol Farm first. So in the top right, I'll click connect and Phantom. Now I'm connected to Phantom. And what I wanna do is I now wanna scroll down to Sol USDC. And as we see here, I can choose to deposit uh, my max balance. So I'm going to click max on USDC and it automatically sets it, uh, the soul, the equivalent soul amount for me. So when I click deposit, it prompts me to approve and there, it's done. We're deposited. We'll give it a second to refresh on the Soul Farm website. I can actually scroll up to the top and click the refresh button right here in the top right. And another thing I can do to filter out everything so that I don't have to see it, see this button right up here at the top right, show staked. If I flip that on, now we're cooking. Look, my deposited balance is now showing up. Very, very cool. And if you wait just a little bit of time, when you hover over this little green trophy, it shows you how much you've actually made up since your last deposit or withdrawal, which I think is pretty fascinating. Now, when you're ready to withdraw from Soul Farm, you can simply click on the box, slide it back out to withdraw, and choose the withdraw button. We'll say, go ahead and withdraw. We'll approve it one more time. And now it is withdrawn. So my screen updates and I no longer show that I'm deposited in the Soul USDC farm anymore. When I check out Phantom, it absolutely did withdraw back into my Soul in USDC balance, which is so incredibly helpful and handy. So this is one of the ways that you can get started. Now, I do want to point out another thing that you could encounter if you're not going the Orca route. You see, if I actually unhide all of this and I wanted to do something, let's say that was based on Saber, because Saber has some pretty uh, interesting deposits too. Let's say I wanted to deposit into UST and USDC. So if I click on this, look, it tells me get UST, USDC LP. So I click on that button and it takes me over to the actual UST USDC pool on the Saber website. From here, I would deposit this into the pool. So what happens when you actually deposit into a liquidity pool, you'll deposit your USDC in, and Saber in this case will give you an LP token in return. So your wallet will then be holding an LP token, which is basically your way of like claiming what you are entitled to from the pool. It's kind of like when you get bowling shoes from the bowling alley and they give you a ticket so you can get your regular shoes back. That's kind of what it's like. So with that LP token in your possession, 
then you can come to Soul Farm and deposit your LP token. And that's what starts giving you yields and returns from that saver pool. So I wanted you to make, make you aware of that and what's going on out there in the real world. Now, DeFi, this was just how to get yields out of DeFi in the form of decentralized exchanges. DeFi is even bigger. There are loans, there's leverage farming, and all of these things come with certain amounts of risk that you should always do your own research on. This was more or less a primer in DeFi. So again, before you ape into any of this, you need to do a lot of due diligence on your own and make sure you're testing the waters correctly uh, and doing your research on the teams that you're getting behind and how you're doing DeFi and what are you really buying when you buy this. That You got to do a lot of research here because there's a lot of scams out there uh, and it's it's not always the safest place. Now, in my experience, the stuff that you see on Soul Farm, the stuff that you see in Solana has been a very great ecosystem to work in on, but who's to say what the future holds? So that's how to get started in DeFi and start earning yields on your tokens right now. Great yields on your tokens while still remaining liquid. Thanks for stopping by, y'all. See you in the next one.